Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Let's wait a bit for everybody to join. We're still having people joining. So let's wait one more minute before we start with the webinar. All right, I think we might start then. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. My name's Aidan Wilson. Uh, I'm an e-research analyst at uh, Intercept for Australian Catholic University. Uh, I've got my colleagues here with me today. So Anastasios Papayuanou, very long Greek surname that I try to pronounce as well as I can. Um, and Anastasios is the, um, he's the manager of our training program and also our lead data scientist. And Wei Si Chen, uh, who is an e-research analyst um, with us at UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. Um, and uh, a, a, before we get started, I might remind everybody that after this webinar, which should go for you know a little bit less than an hour, we're having a, a discussion, an open discussion that everybody's welcome to, to discuss anything that comes up in this. You can ask more questions, if, especially if there's questions that overflow from um, the session today. We'll put the link in the, uh, the chat window um, towards the end of the webinar. We don't want people to accidentally click it too soon and get booted out of this. Um, so we'll put that up uh, in a little while. Um, we will all be monitoring the Q&A in the chat. So feel free to put in uh, questions there and we will um, answer those questions in a Q&A session at the end of this. Uh, and I think that's about all the housekeeping. Did I forget anything, guys? No, good. I think okay. we're ready to start. All right, great. Well, before we get started, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the country, uh, the, of the lands on which we're meeting. And so if you go forward a slide. Yeah. Uh, so in the spirit of reconciliation, Intersect Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders, past, present and uh, future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Uh, we also specifically acknowledge the um, the Bidjigal, the Wangal and the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, um, uh, which are the traditional owners of the country on which we three live and work. And now I'll pass on to Anastasios to give an introduction to who Intersect is. Yes, thanks Aidan for the intro. Um, first of all, uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm Anastasios. Um, as Aidan mentioned, I'm the research training uh, manager and lead research data scientist at Intersect. My background is from physics and I use all these tools actually as part of my research um, and all, all the four languages actually that we're going to discuss. So a few things about Intersect. Intersect is a not-for-profit uh, member-based uh, organization. Uh, we currently have 12 member universities across um, five states and territories in Australia. Main presence in uh, New South Wales, but also presence in Victoria, ICT and South Australia. One of the services that we provide a lot is uh, apart from compute and access to compute and access to storage is energy and learn. Energy is the services team that I'm going to explain a bit more and learn is like the training program that we run to um, upskilled researchers. So here uh, you can see all the member universities that we have um, currently at Intersect and the researcher engagement model that we um, have and operate. So we usually have a new research analyst as Aidan and uh, Wacy are for ACU, Australian Catholic University and University of Technology Sydney uh, respectively and the idea is that one uh, on campus specialist is uh, at each member university to support uh, researchers uh, in terms of digital tools and technologies and this team is working like collaboratively so like everything that's happening in each university can be like shared as knowledge to other universities and keeps going like that here is the whole team of uh, experts. So it's a diverse background of people like coming from ICT, from linguistics, uh, as Aidan, for example. Myself, I'm coming from physics. We have people from sports sciences, from engineering, from um, healthcare data, or um, 
different areas, psychology as well, and goes on. Uh, a bit to talk a bit about uh, training. We're doing a lot of training. To be honest, I, we think we are one of the biggest provider of training in Australia, and um, we're doing this as a research project. So we evaluate our training, and we're trying to measure the impact of training, and we're trying to deliver as best quality as possible. So last year we have um, different metrics to measure the quality. So we have the net promoter score which was uh, plus 70, which is excellent. And also other metrics to measure the quality of the delivery. Like as you can see here, five different metrics. So all of them are um, nine plus uh, from a scale from zero to 10. Uh, we do this a lot. So last year we, um, due to COVID, we had to shift everything online. We tested a lot, we did a lot, and we managed to uh, come up with uh, a framework to keep the interactivity and all the hands-on uh, things um, in the online um, uh, way. So we delivered more than 300 courses last year and we trained around 5.5 thousand researchers across Australia. And as you can see, like the biggest um, percentage of people was in uh, New South Wales, but we had presence in Victoria and South Australia and ACT. One of the most popular tools last year was R, followed by Python, and then RedCup, which is a serving tool, Excel, which is still like uh, quite popular among researchers, and then Qualtrics as well. Historically, like we started uh, all this training program back in 2012, training 10 people, and then you can start seeing the exponential growth of the training. And this year, we are happy that we reached 20,000 researchers trained since uh, 2012. You can also see the uh, evaluation, how it goes through the years, that it's constantly increasing every year, and also the average um, NPS that we have. Quickly to talk about the webinar series, it's something that we started last year, and we, it's an open and free for everybody. Uh, this year we have this um, support uh, hour after the webinars that um, we're trialing. Uh, you can see other available webinars that we have, for example, the fundamentals of programming, the showcase of data analytics in Python and R, serving tools comparison between the two most popular uh, tools in academia, Rectobate Qualtrics, and also like, uh, like comparison between HPC and cloud computing. Another webinar that's coming soon is the data visualization techniques and storytelling. If you want to see other recordings of these webinars, you can visit intersect.org.au uh, slash training slash webinars. Here is our full course catalog. It goes from research computing, programming, data analytics, and data management, different levels. Uh, we have a full um, catalog of um, training, especially in programming, starting from really awareness level, going all the way uh, to intro with R, Python, MATLAB, and Julia. Then a bit more advanced um, concepts uh, in uh, R, Python, Julia going all the way to intro to machine learning, which uh, was introduced last year. So we're trying to uh, keep uh, adding more courses in this um, category. You can find everything, uh, everything on our website, industry.org.au, and you can see like you can select the different categories or the different levels, uh, and then it's gonna show you actually like if you click webinars, all the available webinars and description and also learning ob objectives for each course. We also offer training for non-member universities. Uh, for member universities, this is a different service that we provide. So all our courses are provided through the membership. But we started providing also training for individuals and for um, like a course, actually, for service course. Uh, I'll, we'll, we can talk a bit more about it um, later on, but you can visit our website and you can find under training um, a lot of information about the pricing, how you can access this individual ticket training if you're from a non-member university as well. I'll um, hand over to Wacy now. Hi everyone. Um, so basically, uh, this webinar. Back to this topic. Um, this webinar was developed uh, uh, for UTS initially, uh, back in 2018. So basically, uh, UTS researchers were kind of hesitating uh, which uh, program languages you know they should use for their research as a start. That's why uh, we developed uh, this uh, kind of uh, short session. Uh, 
uh, at the beginning. And then uh, this session has been enriched by our team. Uh, and we have run, uh, you know, this one at uh, RESPAS in 2019 and at other universities like uh, Newcastle as well uh, in 19 as well. And, uh, and last year it has formally become uh, our uh, Intersect webinar series. So uh, that's why we are running this again this year. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, we are going to talk about four programming languages today, uh, MATLAB, Python, R and Julia. And out of these four uh, programming languages, uh, you know, the first three, MATLAB, Python and R, um, have relatively long uh, history already. So basically, um, you know, there are quite a lot of users already, you know, the user base are big and uh, you can uh, get a lot of support on that as well. And Julia is relatively new. So uh, the user base is relatively small, but uh, it's uh, slowly catching up as well. Uh, we're going to talk about different topics today. So first of all, we're going to talk about why we should program. So why programming? And uh, uh, then we'll hand it over to Anastasius to talk about use cases. And we're going to quickly overview uh, the programming languages, you know, all these, the, the, uh, the similarities and differences. And we're going to give you some examples, you know, how to code with these programming languages and what kind of things you can do. And finally, we're going to have a, an open discussion uh, about the popularity and job opportunities, um, you know, when you have this skill. And finally, um, uh, to wrap up, we'll uh, have some tips for you on how to choose from these languages. Uh, in terms of why we should learn programming, uh, programming can do a lot. First of all, you can conduct com complex set of calculations. You know, sometimes you know, simple calculations, you can do it, uh, you know, uh, easily in Excel or whatever. But uh, for complex set of calculations, programming is, has its advantages. Uh, you can also solve complex pro pro problems like machine learning problems. And uh, sometimes it's the only way. So programming uh, languages can do that, but uh, you can't do it in some other tools. Um, and of course, it can speed up and strengthen your analysis. Um, so basically, your analysis will be, uh, uh, will be faster uh, if you can program and reproduce your results. You can automate tasks. You may, you may have different steps in your analysis and you can create pipelines, um, you know, and, uh, using programming languages to, uh, you know, go over from step one to step 10 easily with a program, uh, with your code. And of course, so, you know, if you can uh, uh, reproduce your result using your, uh, prog using the programming languages, it means that you can rerun whatever you have done, um, you know, with, with your uh, code and you can change the parameters every time just to run a slightly different analysis without changing a lot of your code. Um, it's pretty, you know, fast and easy um, as long as you know how to program it. Um, and yeah, as I said, it, it can facilitate reproducible research as you, you know, because you can, you can reproduce your results. And finally, it can uh, develop uh, structured and creative or critical thinking out of it. Um, and uh, last but not least, you can uh, improve your uh, career development. You know, since you've got these skills, uh, chances are that you, you may find more opportunities to find a job that requires this sort of uh, skill. Thanks, Lacey. Um, just to talk a bit more about use cases, uh, programming can be found nowadays in uh, all disciplines. So I, I can say that nowadays. So back in the days, it was more uh, related to IT or um, uh, engineering or other like hard sciences or natural sciences. But now like you can find programming like um, being used in every discipline and the advantages that you can find is everywhere. It's exactly the same advantages with, um, within any discipline. So I have some uh, use cases here, like um, I'm coming from a physics background. Uh, I did this as uh, part of my studies. Uh, it was impossible to solve uh, several uh, mathematical equations and several problems by not using numerical approaches and using programming to solve equations. So um, that's, that's uh, one of the use cases and it goes back to what Wacy said. So sometimes it's the only way to, to do things. Um, molecular dynamic simulations and big simulations and modeling is another um, one that is using a lot of programming behind the scenes because like all uh, is using numerical approaches as well, numerical calculations and trying to um, um, uh, different simulations to perform in 
really big machines. Uh, so you're trying to speed up and make it feasible, like to uh, explore these kind of interactions and things. Um, otherwise, would be uh, impossible. Um, genomics is one really good topic where you start uh, exploring and trying to um, unravel like a lot of complexity uh, within the genomes. Um, 3D modeling of uh, different parts of um, human body or biomedical engineering and simulations there. Um, electromagnetic simulation. So they, they, there are so many use cases like here are just a few of them. For example, this is another one coming from NCI, the National Engineering um, Architecture, which is the Earth in the core. And then plenty of use cases. So we can talk about use cases like for hours and hours uh, if we're here. So this is just a small uh, example of um, cases where you can use uh, programming, but this is just a small, tiny subset. Okay, I'll hand over now to uh, Aidan, who is gonna present Python, and then we're gonna start presenting its programming language like with the pros and cons and a bit of history. Yep, thanks Anastasia. So we'll, um, we'll go through each uh, language with the same, with the same kind of uh, topics to discuss. Uh, so a little bit about the history of, uh, of Python. Python was first created uh, in 1991 by a guy called Guido Van Rossum. Um, it's, uh, if it matters to you, it was inspired by C. Um, it actually had it impacts on a little bit of how the language is uh, from a usability standpoint, which we'll cover um, in, a, in a little while, uh, and Modular 3 and, and ABC, which mean actually the last two mean nothing to me. Uh, Python, if you uh, suspected, actually did get its name from Monty Python's Flying Circus. Um, uh, developers seem to have a weird sense of, of, uh, of humor. Uh, it it emphasizes productivity and code readability. Uh, and I should stress that from a, be a beginner's perspective, uh, Python is very much readable. And uh, as a result, it's easier to learn in my personal opinion, but we'll do more of that analysis. Uh, later, um, it's also huge, so it can be extended with one of you know any one of over one hundred thirty thousand packages that uh, various developers are maintaining themselves to do all sorts of things that uh, uh, really anything under the sun. Uh, the the advantages of Python are that it is open source. Most of the tools that we're discussing today are open source. Um, if you don't know what that is, it means that the source code is uh, openly inspectable by anybody, which means that uh, if the developers are going to put in some nasty bit of malicious code, then other people would know about it. Um, so there's a bit of an assurance there. The syntax, as I said before, is easy to understand code and debug, um, and uh, learning it is, is pretty quick as a result. It's a good general purpose language, so it didn't spring up from a research use case, but it is so general purpose in its, in its, uh, in its use cases that uh, you could uh, use it for anything including, of course, research. There is a vast collection of libraries ready for use, and uh, its typical uses are in things like data analysis, data visualization, lots of data science, uh, many, many more. The community is wider, obviously, than just researchers. There's people working in full stack developing that do whole websites, games in, in Python, uh, which is perhaps less the case for the other languages that are more um, oriented around particular communities of practice. The, there are some disadvantages, of course, um, and drawbacks. The installation of Python on your local machine is not necessarily easy. Uh, and when it is easy, you can end up still with some environment issues. And uh, there was a big migration from version two to version three if, quite a few years ago now, but um, there's still a bit of an over, uh, a bit of a hangover from, from some of that stuff. So if you're working with code that has dependencies on, uh, on version two, then those will have to be upgraded to version three. Just to list some of the key libraries that would be useful for uh, researchers. Uh, here, here's a list of them. I'll, I'll sort of go through them in some very slight deta detail. Uh, NumPy is very commonly used for basically numeric Py, numeric Python, uh, which is fundamental for scientific computing. Uh, Pandas is a fantastic library for data structures and data analysis. There's also a bunch of tools around machine learning and deep learning, including uh, TensorFlow is, is, is a very big one, PyTorch and uh, Scikit-learn, um, which is a machine learning, uh, these are all machine learning algorithms essentially. SciPy, another one for scientific and technical computing, 
Matplot, Lib and Seaborn are both excellent libraries for visualization and outputting uh, uh, publication ready diagrams and charts. And uh, a personal favorite of mine, given the, that I'm a linguist, is the Natural Language Toolkit, uh, uh, acronymized as NLTK. This is very, very widely used and uh, it's got lots of good functions for analyzing text, uh, uh, in particular, well, in, in many languages, but in English you can you can take a, a large word and stem it down to its um, down to its stem, uh, and do some processing on 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 language and so on. All right. So uh, in terms of R, we're going to talk about the same items. First of all, uh, a bit of history on R. Uh, I was developed in two, uh, 1993 uh, at the University of Auckland, Auckland so not too far away from us. Um, so that's that's why you can see any kind of creative idea can uh, actually benefit the you know the research community as well. So uh, it was based on S language. S language was not open source, but R was made open source. Um, so it was designed for statistical computing and uh, graphics at the beginning, and now um, since R has been so widely used that um, many many new packages and you know can be used to extend the functionality of R. So it's more and more used as you know a general purpose tool, um, you know like Python. But still, you know many people are using it uh, as you know uh, for statistical analysis. Next page, please. So advantages, first of all, again, it's open source and um, you, know, you can get the full code of R and it was oriented to statistical analysis and data processing. So if you are doing uh, statistical analysis or data processing, R um, has its advantages. Um, it has large collection of packages that you can directly use like Python, uh, but um, you know, R and Python both have its own uh, sort of packages, you know, uh, it's unique packages that you can use. So, uh, I think one of the um, you know one of the ideas is that um, you can choose the language based on the package you need. So if you if your uh, you know colleagues are using this particular package, you can consider using this language you know uh, to use that package, uh, and it's good for visualization. So uh, it can you know some of the packages available in R can generate very um, shiny or fancy visualization uh, charts or diagrams. Um, and the vectorized operation, uh, operations is basically uh, a key feature of R. Uh, it is highly efficient as well. So you will learn more about vectors in R, you know, when, uh, if, you're, if you're attending one of our R training courses. Um, in terms of the community, um, of course, so researchers use, uh, use R and data scientists, statisticians, and data analysts. Uh, there are some drawbacks, of course. Um, so the syntax is a little bit complicated and it's not easy for beginners. And when you come across some error messages, the debugging information is not very clear that, point, uh, that points you to the right direction to change the code or modify the code. Um, so, um, you know, uh, as long as you've got, a, you know, you've got experienced, you are experienced user, uh, you find the information still not very clear, but you know, and, you, know you know, what to do. Uh, as you, you've got enough experience. Uh, and at the start, the, le uh, the learning curve is a little bit steep. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not only because of the syntax, the debugging information, uh, but also uh, because of, you know, uh, uh, so R is not a general purpose tool. So uh, it was st uh, designed for statisticians at the beginning and it has its own uh, kind of limitations. Um, so, Another drawback is uh, another drawback is that um, when you are dealing with big data, um, when you are doing a lot of calculation on huge data sets, uh, it may become a little bit slow, and your memory can be eaten up very quickly, especially when you are using a lot of loops or loops into loops. Um, so the memory can be used up very quickly. That's uh, another drawback. So. Um, I would like to talk more about the key libraries of R. So when you're using R, these are the um, very popular uh, libraries that you can use. First of all is Tidyverse. So Tidyverse is basically a collection of uh, packages, not only one. So uh, it includes read R, which is for data import. And we've got dplyr and tidyr for data manipulation. And finally, we've got ggplot2, which is very popular for data visualization. 
And we've also got um, the library called Zoo, which is for time series uh, processing. Um, and we have our text tools for text classification. Um, you know, it's one uh, method of machine learning as well. So if you are dealing with text analysis, our uh, text tools uh, would be the package you, you should use. And there are some other packages or libraries that you can use for machine learning. Uh, one of them is called Carrot, Random Forest, and so on. Okay, so now I'll jump on to uh, MATLAB. So MATLAB is another tool that has a long history. It was originally developed in uh, the 1970s um, and it was rewritten in C again uh, in 1984. Um, it was designed mainly for engineers uh, or um, mathematicians and scientists. So it's good at data modeling um, and you know, uh, mathematical kind of analysis. And it's widely used in government, business, and universities uh, at the moment. Um, the tool can also be extended with uh, uh, packages, but these are not external packages. These packages are kind of inbuilt. So there are more than uh, 35K um, tools or packages available there uh, you can use directly, as long as you've got a valid license to use MATLAB. Um, and internationally, there are uh, more than 3 million users already. So it's a very big uh, user base. Um, so faculties and students of universities usually have their access um, through uh, a campus-wide license. Um, and it's basically offered to researchers for free. Uh, the advantages of MATLAB, first of all, it's easy to use um, compared with uh, some other uh, you know, general purpose uh, you know, programming languages, um, it's easier uh, to use in terms of uh, the graphical uh, interface that you can interact with. Um, and you can also use the apps or uh, we, we call them packages or libraries inside the tool. Um, so a lot of functionality can be used directly. So you don't need to, re, uh, you know, rewrite or write the code to achieve certain uh, goal. So there may be some existing tool that you can use directly. And the documentation is uh, uh, comprehensive or extensive. So um, you, you will find the help information. Um, chances are that when you get stuck, you get enough documentation to start with. Um, and the graphics modeling and simulations are optimized for efficiency. Uh, so that's another advantage of MATLAB. Um, and in MATLAB, there are vectorized operations as well. So as I mentioned, R in R, so vectorized operations is one of the key features. In MATLAB, um, uh, we have this feature as well. Um, so it has two releases per year. So basically, you know, it's updated, uh, upgraded regularly. Um, so basically, you know, uh, you have new features or uh, bug fixes, um, you know, in a timely manner. So that's the advantages. And now I'll, have, I'll show you some of the key libraries or key uh, applications in uh, uh, MATLAB. So all these tools can be found in this link, mathworks.com uh, slash products. And these are all inbuilt um, uh, in the MATLAB tool. So uh, when you log into, or when you open MATLAB and you can find these two kits and use them directly. And the drawbacks of MATLAB, um, so I like the other two uh, languages we just talked about, Python and R are both um, uh, open source, but MATLAB is not. Um, you must have a license to, to use it. So maybe after your research at your university, um, you, you will lose the, the license and the license will be quite expensive outside of universities. Um, so since it has continual um, upgrade cycles, um, it may mean that there may be some uh, compatibility uh, errors when it's been upgraded to a new version. And the user community and support is largely contained within MATLAB Central and uh, File Exchange. Um, you know, so when you, you know, when you are searching for a particular problem, uh, you, you may encounter um, you know, for your programming in R or Python, chances are that you will find an answer on Stack Exchange or GitHub, or, you know, uh, you know, if you Google, you'll find a lot of answers. Uh, but on MATLAB, 
uh, you may find less answers on these open kind of open uh, channels like Stack Exchange or Google. Uh, and some of the support questions are kind of only posted within MATLAB Central. So, um, but it's been growing, you know. So if you search nowadays, you know, on MATLAB problems, um, you may find more answers than uh, 10 years ago. So, which is a good trend. Perfect. This goes to the little brother now, Julia. Uh, I'm one of the enthusiasts uh, about Julia and it's a really new uh, programming language. So Julia is a high level, high performance, dynamic programming language. Uh, general purpose mostly. However, like many of its features um, uh, are well suited actually for numerical analysis and computational science. Uh, I'm really enthusiastic with Julia because of several reasons I'm going to explain, but just a bit of history before. It uh, was developed uh, back in 2012, so not far uh, long ago. It um, was developed at MIT uh, with um, the creators being uh, Jeff Besanson, Alan Edelman, and Stefan Karpinski and Viol Sa. Uh, there is a commercial version where you can uh, use cloud uh, to do Julia, like to run Julia, like you can find all the the information in Julia Computing. It's an open source and free, of course, like to run locally, but they have also their cloud uh, compute that you can uh, access it and do like the big, bigger jobs. Uh, it can be extended with uh, packages. So um, there is a growing list. At the moment, it's more than uh, 4,000 packages. And you can find the description of all the packages and you can search actually for keywords to see like what tools is, uh, what packages are for what uh, kind of uh, reasons. Um, okay, so advantages of Julia. So there are quite a lot to be honest, uh, and it's worthwhile uh, um, testing it. So it's an open source, it's uh, R and Python, so it means that the source code is available to everybody. Uh, it's efficient, efficient for different styles of coding. So it's one of the languages where the style of coding doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter, like, it's, like for example, in Python and R, there's ways to say, like, you know, vectors are fast or in Python, like other things are faster than loops, for example. Here, it doesn't matter, things are fast, no matter what. Uh, optimization is less complex, so you can optimize your code without putting so much effort, which is a big step usually when you use uh, Python R and other programming languages. Uh, of course, you have the ability, because it's a new language, ability to call C code, or Python R, Java code as well. Uh, it's really highly readable uh, syntax, so it means that if you're new and you don't understand, like it's really well, um, uh, it's really readable. So for new users, uh, multiple dispatch simplicity. I'm not going to touch too much, but it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of like how you can use functions and what kind of things they can do. Uh, the idea behind this, and I'm going to show you in the next slide, is. The inspiration was actually, let's take the best elements of uh, programming languages and put them together into a single one. Because in the past, you could use Python for uh, something, for the extent of the libraries, then you can use R for the beautiful graphs, and then you can go back to uh, Python to, to do something else, like machine learning, then do another programming language for something else. So we're trying to diminish all these problems with just a single one. It's really scalable. To be honest, uh, the owner, the developers claim that it's unlimited, the scalability, which is fascinating. And it's fast. And when I'm saying fast, I'm talking about really fast. So it's one uh, language that is now part of something that's called a closed loop of the Petaflop, Petaflop Club, which was only C, C++, and Fortran, which means that uh, they managed to achieve performance of uh, 1.5 petaflops per second, which means um, 1.5 uh, quadrillion uh, floating point operations per second, which is massive. Um, so this was a project um, uh, cataloging the visible universe using different uh, um, techniques, and they managed to achieve this uh, 1.5 petaflops uh, using 650,000 cores at the same time. So it's really fascinating to see like all this happening with a single programming language. So here we have uh, something that um, the, uh, the developers of Julia said in, uh, back in, um, I don't remember when, is, when was it. it, it was one of the interviews and they were saying that we want to the speed of C with the dynamism of Ruby. 
uh, obvious familiar mathematical notations like MATLAB. We want the usable of general programming as Python, as easy for statistics, for statistics as R, and as powerful for linear algebra as MATLAB. So you see that the concept behind Julia is actually like, let's try to combine everything, take all the best elements and trying to make a single language. Uh, of course, there are some um, drawbacks. Uh, steep learning curve. So if you're really new to programming and you want to learn programming, Julia probably is not the best one to start learning. There are other programming languages like Python, um, which are much better as a first step. Uh, but I would definitely recommend it as a second, third language for sure. Uh, it's relatively new, so it means that there are not many versions and there are big jumps in versions. So for example, there was a version one uh, released in uh, 2018 and there was a big jump between uh, uh, the zero versions to one. Uh, there was a huge um, release also with 1.6 version at the end of last year uh, with huge increase in uh, different aspects. For example, like for me, it was really frustrating to import the packages. It was taking time. So all these problems have been fixed now and the speed has even more increased now. So it's, uh, it's impressive actually the jumps, but still like a, not a fully mature uh, language in, in terms of community as well. Uh, available libraries are less than uh, other languages, still like all the hot topics. Uh, there are packages for that, like machine learning or um, linear algebra and mathematical operations and computational things. Uh, debugging may be really challenging because um, for me, like one of the best debugging um, debuggers is Python because it's simple. Uh, it shows you exactly where the problem is uh, in a really readable uh, way. Debugging in Julia may be challenging, so it doesn't give you like a really um, good understanding where the error is. So it may take some time until you understand like how it works. Um, and sometimes attention to do language types is needed to get uh, best performance, but in general, like performance is already there and it doesn't need much attention, uh, but sometimes like depends on what you have to do. And of course, like uh, as I said, it's best for more experienced programmers. I wouldn't recommend it as a first language to start in the market, but it's definitely like worth um, checking it later on when you feel that you are ready to um, jump to another one or see like uh, benefits from another language. Okay, so I'm gonna do the code comparison. This way you can have a better understanding of how the code, the same code looks in uh, different languages. So I'm gonna just, um, Okay, and start with um, Python and Julia. So on the left part, you can see uh, Jupyter Lab, which is one of the um, editors for uh, Python. Um, we use uh, one of the examples that we use actually when we teach, which is coming from Software Carpentries, um, which is a great source of um, uh, open source courses for um, the students actually. Uh, they have material like for uh, into, uh, like really beginners. So here, for example, like we have how you can import a library using an import command and we import matplotlib and numpy. Then we import the files that we're interested in and then we just um, calculate the average value per column. And then we just plot it. So that's the code in Python to perform a graph like that where it takes an array of values and calculate something per column, like the average value per column, and then it plots its, uh, it, it plots the average value. So this way you can see the day of treatment, for example, and the average inflammation value as it increases and increases. Uh, here is the definition of a function. So it starts with the keyword def, and then followed by the name of the function, all the arguments inside the parentheses, and then finalize the syntax using column. And then using the, and the indentation we include things inside. This is important in Python because we don't use any brackets in, or as in other programming languages to define what is included in the function. So this indentation is really important in Python. Uh, and then here we do all the operations inside the function. So we say like, okay, load the file based on what you give us and then calculate the average value per column and then plot. And if we take and do it uh, for more than one data sets, for example, here we call two data sets and we call a loop, which is like starts with the keyword for, 
uh, we use a variable like um, a loop variable called f and then the set of values that we take in each iteration. So f takes values from the file name. So in the first iteration, it's going to analyze like things in information 01. And in the second iteration, it's going to analyze things in 02. So when you get one element, you print the what is the element, and then you perform all the things that we saw in the analyze. And that's the two graphs actually for the two um, data sets. So this is in Python. So if I go to Julia now, uh, here is how you import packages. Uh, so using instead of import. Uh, as you can see, there are pretty much similar things. So we use a different function called read DLM to import an array. Uh, then we use the mean function to calculate the average uh, inflammation per column. And then we do the plotting using the plot function and that's what we get. Um, so the same graph. Then to create a function, like we use the function keyword instead of def, which uh, makes it more readable. Uh, analyze, uh, which is the name of the function, all the arguments inside the parentheses, and then you can see there is a net keyword, which finalizes the syntax of the function. This way it makes it more uh, easy not to forget or not to include inside the function. So here we do exactly the same. We read the file, we'll calculate the average inflammation per day, uh, per column and then we plot and display the plot and if i do a loop as you can see here it's the same keyword called for uh, a variable that is running inside the loop file names is the set of data so two data sets that we're running and then we just display the value of f which is first is the information one then it's information two i just pause it for 0 0.5 this way it doesn't go like crazy and then analyze f. So I'm calling the function with the file name in each iteration. So first with this and then second with that. And we can have the two graphs. So then I can show you in uh, MATLAB. I hope uh, I need to start quickly. So MATLAB is a bit different than uh, what we saw in Python and, um, and, and Julia. So in Python, in order to create functions, you need to use uh, use the SNN file. So it's a different um, structure, let's say, of the way it works. So analyze is a function. So we need to call a new M file, that is a MATLAB file. So function, then the name of the function, and then uh, inside the parentheses we have the arguments. Then we read the whatever argument you put here. So the file name in this case. We calculate the average information today, um, per column, then plotting, and then we add the X and Y labels. So in terms of uh, coding, it's pretty similar. The only the big difference is that it's a standalone doc, uh, file uh, instead of being embedded in the main script. And here is the script. So we clear and we close all the active windows. We collect the file names, for example, information one and two. And then the loop is like that. So for, which is exactly the same keyword that you see in other programming languages. F is a variable that is running inside within the loop and then takes the values from this file name. And then we do the same. We open a new figure and then we run the analyze function. And the last one quickly, just to show you, this is RStudio, which is the most common uh, editor for R. Um, here uh, is the editor and as you can see here we have different uh, panels so we have the console where it's displaying the output um, we have the environment where we can see all the variables and we have also the plots and everything so what I do here I just um, read the file the CSV file we calculate the um, average information per day uh, and then we plot the graph and using like labels for X and Y and all these things. To create a function in um, R is a bit different. So first you call the name of the function and then you assign a function to it. So using the keyword function where you add all the, file, the arguments here. And then with the curly uh, brackets, you include things inside the function. So import the data file, um, do the calculation for the average and then plot. And then this is a list of the two items or vector and then for uh, loop is like with the parentheses and then f is the variable in file names 
file names is the two uh, items here, the elements, and then I just bring the name and analyze. So you can see the name here, but the graphs are here. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the presentation now. And we're going to discuss a bit about um, popularity and um, job opportunities. So, Aiden, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Anastasius. Um, so, uh, yes, we 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 updated these stats this morning. So we've 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 checked this, um, and uh, things are basically the same as they were last year, with a couple of minor uh, variations. So uh, this, these, two, these two screenshots are various indices of uh, language popularity. Um, the left one is uh, called PIPAL, which um, indexes Google searches, uh, just using Google Trends, I think it, it uses. Um, so you know, they're, not, they're not infallible at all. Um, and Python's at the top. Uh, I think last year it was in uh, second position or something. Uh, and you'll see down the list there is also R in seventh position, MATLAB in eleventh position, way down to Julia in in twenty third position. Um, uh, the what might seem like unpopularity of Julia is actually just a recency effect, I think. So it's just because Julia's not been um, around for as long as the other two. Sorry, the other three um, that uh, it's it's still got a ways to go. But you'll see those three ticks that mean it's kind of in improving every year. Um, and I think since last year, it's climbed a few places on that index. Looking at the right, um, this is the Tyobe, Tyobe, I don't know how to pronounce it, index, which uh, is, is an, ind I'm reading now, it's an indicator of the popularity of programming languages. So the index is updated once a month, and the ratings are based on the number of skilled engineers worldwide, courses, and third-party vendors. Popular search engines such as Google, Bing, Yahoo, Wikipedia, Amazon, YouTube, and Baidu, are used to calculate the ratings. It is important to note that the Tyobe index is not about the best programming language or the language in which the most lines of co code have been written. So again, take that with a grain of salt, but um, the results are pretty similar. Python comes in uh, as a clear winner of the four that we are dealing with today, um, with R followed by MATLAB, and then Julia is kind of way down in, in 30th uh, position. But, uh, but even then, Julia has climbed a few positions since last year. Interestingly, R in 13th position has dropped a few places. So it used to be seventh um, last year. So that's just part of you know, ebb and flow and the fluctuate, the natural yearly fluctuation of, uh, of, of things like Google searches and Bing searches, which no one, uh, no one can control. And so I guess it just underscores the unreliability of these indices. Anything else to add on that, guys? No, I just uh, want to say that uh, Julia, like there is always like Stack, Stack Overflow is doing a survey uh, about the programming languages that are used widely and like programming languages that people love to program and would like to start. Uh, one of the most popular ones that when people start programming, they really like is start scaling up like Julia, I think it's fifth or sixth now. So Python is one of the top, of course, but Julia is gaining a lot of, um, uh you know like popularity and people who are using it uh they really like it so it's it's becoming like slowly popular and of course like it's hard to beat all these players like from all these years but uh i think it's gonna grow quite fast in the future but yeah uh someone in the chat has just uh informed me that baidu is china's top search engine thank you very much that's helpful to know um, so this this uh, uh, chart is the results of some searches on Seek and Indeed.com for job vacancies. Uh, we used it down there in the in the bottom. You can see the search term that we use. So the program language, whatever it is, say Python, um, and one of the words programmer, programming developer, data or scientist. We had to do that because um, if you search for Julia, you get a whole bunch of ads for uh, that mention somebody's name. Um, however, you still get ads that mention someone's name by Julia, such as the, the, the job contact. So that 30 for the uh, Julia in indeed.com and also the 65 jobs for Julia in seek.com that I should be, we, we saw a few that were, that had nothing to do with Julia. So uh, that had the name on, on the contact. Uh, not all of them, but uh, those numbers are certainly inflated. So just a caveat there. Another caveat under R 
is that uh, if you've ever tried to Google R, um, it's a letter, it's very frequent, it occurs a lot in English, so it uh, is a very hard thing to, to search for, and it's similarly hard on seek.com and indeed.com. So uh, these numbers should really be taken with a grain of salt. But you can see that the, uh, these numbers pretty much align with the earlier indices where Python is right at the top, uh, most popular language amongst these four, most widely sought after, um, and then R, Patton, then MATLAB, then Julia. Um, another thing to point out is that there was a lot of ads that we saw that were looking for somebody with you know, experience in one of several languages and the more the, the, the better the prospects. So something we'll get to later is, um, is that, you know, why stop at one? If, if you're going to learn programming, you can learn multiple languages and then you're more employable as a result. So R and Python work together very well. Um, and, and that would be a, a very good addition to someone's skill set to have them both. Any other comments on that? I think you covered everything in this part. All right, so um, Anastasia, maybe you can maybe you can take us through this matrix. Yeah. So of course, this is our uh, personal uh, opinion about all these things. It's not based on any metrics or any kind of official comparison, but it's our pers perception of the the four programming languages. So we have different categories like performance, easy of use, data analytics, support, community library tools available and the job market. So in terms of performance, Julia is by far the best in my personal opinion and as we have it here, uh, followed by Python and then R and MATLAB are coming um, third. Of course, this, is, this can be improved based on optimization, but the, the fact that Julia doesn't need any optimization most of the times and you can write whatever code you want and it's optimized already is a huge advantage. In terms of ease of use, uh, by far, Python for me is uh, one of the easiest to learn and start, uh, followed by, uh, of course, like MATLAB as well. But I, I, I have a tendency to um, go with Python because of the debugging as well, because it's easier to understand the errors, easier to understand, and it's readable as well. Uh, data analytics, uh, a lot of libraries and a lot of things in terms like machine learning, in terms of like hot topics like in data analytics. Um, we can find a lot of libraries, like really mature libraries in Python. I would put, I would, uh, to be honest, I would put Python uh, a tick more uh, based on the scikit-learn and Theno and all these like PyTorch and all these rich libraries for all these uh, AI and machine learning and all the packages that are so long for so many years. Uh, compared to R, but still like uh, both uh, programming languages have really rich libraries in terms of data analytics. The same with MATLAB and Julia, they're gaining a lot um, with the tools for uh, MATLAB and Julia as well with the new packages, but still like the extent of what you can do in Python and R, I think it's um, more than MATLAB and Julia. In terms, in terms of support, we put one here, not because there is not support, but it's because like MATLAB has official support because it's um, not an open source. So here you have a lot of support for Python, R and Julia, but through other peers, so through the community, of course, and everything, that's why we put five in MATLAB and uh, one in others. So in terms of community, Python is by far the biggest, to be honest, because it's such a generic programming language. Uh, it's not only in academia, but it's everywhere. So that's why like uh, the community are uh, as well, like a lot of people are using it nowadays for so many things. Uh, MATLAB and Julia, like a bit less, but still like um, you can find a lot of answers uh, if you look for them. In terms of libraries, Python, R and MATLAB, we put um, five stars, so you can do whatever you can imagine with uh, all of them. Uh, Julia, we put three stars with the potential to have five in the future because like it's growing still like, like a new language. So of course there are not uh, so many people developing uh, packages. In terms of job market, I would definitely put five stars for Python. It's a programming language that it's must to know, like if you would like to follow any career with uh, including programming in the job, uh, you can, it's one of the top programming languages to learn by far. Uh, I would put three stars to be honest now that I think about the R uh, because um, it's great. It's, uh, I'm using it all a lot, but um, I think in terms of job market, the job opportunity they have with Python, you cannot find it with any of the other programming languages. 
Any other things before I move to the next slide? Yeah, I think I might um, mention that uh, there, was a, there was a comment in the chat that about uh, uh, field of use, right? And, and we, we've sort of mentioned the fields that these languages have come out of in the history, but I think it's worth uh, mentioning that, you know, Python is really like almost hyperinflated in our stats here because it's, um, it's used for um, everything, right? It's, it, whereas the other three, are uh, really restricted to their, their kind of market. I mean, less so, people are starting to use R for different kinds of things, for example, but R was born out of a, uh, a statistical computing and research use case. MATLAB is born out of an engineering and, uh, and mathematical uh, computing uh, use case and is now used in industry for things like material science and uh, modeling of uh, 3D you know, visualizations of your models and how they, how they you know, endure stresses and so on that come from whatever heat and bending and things like that for manufacture, right? So it's a very particular use case there that, um, that it was, it's, it's really grown up in. And Julia is kind of too new to, to know, but it, it's, it seems to be within the domain of the uh, computer scientists, I have to say. Um, and so it's probably a bit restricted in, in that sense. Um, I guess this also, you know, if you're planning to stay in academia and continue to use data, you know, do data science and so on, uh, then, you know, the five stars of Python against the job market is uh, misleading because that's Python programmers who can do things like, you know, uh, develop games like Fortnite and, and whatever. Not that Fortnite was in, in, in Python, but um, I think you get my point. So, you know, it's, it's helpful to think about the, the discipline or the field that you're, that you're looking at. And maybe then R uh, or MATLAB would creep to the top view. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. And uh, the the fact that all R, MATLAB, and Julia started from academia, like for this purpose, like it indicates a bit more like the use cases as well compared to Python. Uh, Wes, say anything to add before I move to the next slide? No. That's good. Okay. Perfect. So, Aidan, a few guidelines. Uh, yeah. Um, so. Our take, I guess these are, this is the, the sort of final slide or takeaway from this, right? Um, which is, how do you choose? We're not gonna give you a, you should learn this language. Uh, it depends on your own uh, use case. Probably the, the principles should be what language is used in your field. Um, we've just talked about uh, field, right? And, um, and what language are used by your peers, by your, your current peers, your PhD colleagues, your research team, people who work in your industry or, or whatever. Ask your supervisor um, and ask your colleagues how they do their research. And if they are using Python, it might be it would be beneficial for you to learn Python so that you can reuse their code, uh, or so that you've got peers that can help you debug things or help you learn. Um, uh, so that's a so so you know think of your circles, your inner circle out to the support structures that you that you have, and use the same tools as the people that you're going to be working closely with uh, now and in the future. The second major uh, principle is think about why you're learning to program and what problems you're looking to solve. Uh, so are they small scale problems or big scale data analysis? Are you starting small but gonna go big? Are you looking at building software in general or are you looking to stay within a research use case or data science? Do you wanna build websites? Uh, you know, another question might be, there's a lot of people who are using R to write their, uh, like they link up R with their analysis they perform their analysis and then they output their publications using LaTeX uh, straight into LaTeX from, uh, from R using a package called R Markdown. Um, and there's plenty of, uh, of great presentations around there of people showing off this, this workflow. So R is also used for writing um, uh, academic output, which is, which is really interesting. And also there's, there's a growing use case in people using R to present, uh, you know, instead of PowerPoint, for example. Uh, which is really powerful because you keep everything as text. Um, so if you're doing something like website integration, maybe don't use MATLAB because that, that's unheard of in that, in that realm. Maybe Python is something to aim towards. Or maybe you could learn other things like uh, JavaScript um, uh, and HTML that are used a lot in, in website, website construction and so on. Finally, um, what libraries are there that you can take advantage of? This kind of is... You know, there's a lot of overlap with this and the what is commonly used in your field, right? Because if uh, if 
you're doing, say, material sciences, there might not be packages for that in R, but there will be a lot of in, in MATLAB. So it's really sort of the same consideration. But uh, if you're doing text processing, then look at what languages, look at what packages each of these languages have. Um, Python would be a good one for that because of the natural language toolkit, for example. Whereas if you're looking at data visualization, I mean, all of them can do it, but maybe MATLAB is the better decision because it's, uh, it's a GUI, you know, it's a GUI programming environment. So you can output those uh, visualizations and tables and charts quite a bit more easily than the other languages. Anything else to say on that? I think you covered uh, everything. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so further advice. Um, it's important to note that each language is fundamentally the same. So before, if you're only talking about the basic operation, like importing a CSV file, doing some analysis and maybe some means across row levels or means across column levels and outputting a chart and saving that chart to disk, all the languages are going to be equally fast, equally easy, um, uh, maybe apart from their in, you know, individual proclivities. We have another webinar that goes through um, uh, the fundamentals of programming. Uh, we we uh, presented it, I think, two or three weeks ago. The recording of the last year's run is up on the website. Um, so that's called the Fundamentals of Programming, um, or I think it's called Thinking Like a Computer. Um, and that's a good one to get familiar with the concepts that programming languages use, and is a good primer, therefore, to uh, take into a training workshop so you can understand what's going on. Um, uh, so yeah, all these things are fundamentally the same. So it really doesn't matter which one you learn from, from that perspective at the basic level. Uh, learning to program is going to be difficult for most people the first time you do it. But uh, my experience and I think other people's experience, especially for us at Intersect where we do this a lot, um, each, other, each new language you learn becomes easier and easier uh, because they really are, you know, underlyingly very similar. They might do things slightly differently, but those are the things you learn when you hop from one language to another. So I started learning Python, and then uh, as part of my job here at Intersect, I started to learn some R, and that was an easy transition because I just had to change. It was like, you know, I'm a linguist. It's like learning a new accent, really, um, or a new dialect of, of the same language. Um, I'd recommend trying out a few before specialising. Um, copy your colleagues' codes or, or, or get access to some people's um, uh, 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 code and see if you can tinker. Um, there's lots of environments online. We'll show some where you can learn a bit of, where you can try out a bit of these languages um, and not have to install anything. And as I said before, there are more job, opportunity, job opportunities for people who can combine more than one programming language. So if you have R and Python under your belt, then you are more employable than, um, than just one or the other. Uh, all right, so what do we, what do you do now? Um, we, we would have, if you're interested in learning how to program, look out for introductory training courses in one or another of these programming languages or any programming language. It doesn't, doesn't have to be just limited to these four. You can really learn any programming language. These are the four that we recommend because they're uh, used widely in research. There might be others, but you know, that we haven't covered. Um, there's usually lots of training activity in, uh, in universities uh, or online. Uh, not yet, yeah, not just within universities, but across across the world. There's, there's lots of free, open online uh, programming courses. If you're from an Intersect member, um, you can get access to training at your university, uh, which is all online at the moment because of COVID and and actually because it's it's uh, vastly simpler to to run sometimes and and actually a better experience for everybody. And if you're not from a member, then there are opportunities to come to some of those training courses. Or we we have training courses for non-members. Uh, those incur fees for non-members, um, but that's a possibility as well. Uh, and there's online services to code. Anastasios uh, used some of these. So the first is colab.research.google.com, which allows you to run Python uh, notebooks in the sort of Google Cloud. And it is possible to run Julia notebooks as well with take some coding. There's a, if you're interested in doing that, you can, you can ask and we can give you the links to how you can find out about that. RStudio.cloud allows you to run a, um, an R environment in a cloud computing session, uh, which is also free, I think, to up to a certain amount. Can't go nuts with it, and it's not very fast, but you can at least get familiar with, with RStudio or R. RStudio is the IDE that is typically used. 
Um, MATLAB Online uh, is an online version of MATLAB and you can sign in with your institutional account and get free access, provided you've got uh, a license through your university, which most, most university researchers would. Uh, for Julia specifically, there is a service called Julia Hub. Uh, it used to be free when it was called Julia Box. They've since made it no longer free, um, but it is definitely an option. It's got the latest version of Julia. It will always have the latest version and so on. Lastly, uh, if you're a researcher in Australia, you will have access to CloudStore, which is cloudstore.rnet.edu.au. Maybe one of my colleagues can put that in the chat. And there is a service in there called SWAN. Um, I can't remember what it stands for, but it is a uh, online uh, coding environment, which is supported by a tool called J Jupyter Hub, I think, or Jupyter Lab. Um, and in there, you can run Python, you can run R, and you can run Optiv, which is a free and open source clone of a MATLAB, if you like. So it's a good um, uh, taster for what, for what MATLAB does. Uh, it's good to mention that also CloudStore and Rnet actually are owning CloudStore. They're planning also at some point to uh, install um, Julia as well. So hopefully we can see it in the near future and you can use Julia using JupyterLab. Um, so it's going to be great. On our request, that was, uh, that was something we suggested and they, and they, they, they thought yes. about it. So that'd be, great if, that'd be great if they do that. Yeah. All right. So I think we're done with the presentation. Um, so anything from the Q&A, Aidan and Wacy that you would like to discuss? Uh, we have uh, added the link to the, uh, the open discussion support yeah. session so, after we finish with this. Yes, so that no, nominally starts at 2.30 and goes for you know up to the next hour if there's people interested in attending, where you can bring questions and we can discuss these things uh if if you want to um there were some questions that we answered in the q a so everybody should be able to see those um uh i hope i don't know if we have time to cover any of them but maybe i'll um uh, if people want to discuss those they can bring that to the q a uh i don't know i there's been a lot of chat activity just in the last few minutes so i'm not sure if there's any questions that we've missed way c and oh, no. I actually there's only one left uh which is uh you know, James is asking uh, you to share the information about uh, the, the upcoming R course at ACU. Okay, yeah. There isn't one yet, but there will, there will be. That's the answer yeah. to that. Yeah, we can, uh, so like, um, you can go, we can share a link where they can find the schedule, maybe for James, like um, on our website. Maybe if you guys can add the link to our schedule. Is why like uh, people can go and see like actually where they can find R at ACU, for example, or any of our member universities. All right. Okay, I think we should uh, go over to the the discussion uh, Zoom. So um, if you'd like to continue asking questions or join the discussion, please do. We'll be there for some time. I, I'm not sure if we have meetings that we've got to jump to, but we can at least uh, you know have a good go at it. Um, so at that point, I will um, will stop this webinar, and if you'd like to continue, then please come across. I think someone will be here to make sure that there's uh, uh, that they will still have access to the link. Thank you, thank you very much for attending, everybody. <laughs>